I'm not an expert on wire wire rope. Um, used it for many years, but to help us in this uh, category for wire rope, we bring in Andrew Rogers out of uh, Silver State Wire and Rope from Las Vegas. Morning, guys. Andrew, say hello. Good morning, all. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Good morning to you there. As Jesse said, uh, my name's Andrew. Um, I've uh, been here with Silver State Wire Rope for about 26 years now. Uh, so uh, I've kind of been around and seen seen quite a bit uh, as far as rigging and uh, in multiple different industries. So it's uh, it's been kind of an eye opening experience. A little bit about myself. Um, currently, uh, I'm the the general manager here at Silver State. Um, Kind of had the privilege of uh, <clears throat> of being able to uh, kind of grow with the company, uh, kind of come up with it. I started off in the rigging shop, um, you know, building slings, uh, doing exactly what we're going to be talking about here today, and then I've been able to kind of move throughout the rigging through the, sh the office or the company, uh, moving into uh, hoists, um, and then uh, into sales, and then into fabrication, and then. Uh, finally kind of overseeing uh, all of those. So um, really uh, I'm looking forward to this. This is going to be a lot of fun. Um, really interested in see what kind of questions or uh, thoughts that you got, you all have out there as well. So with that, awesome. we'll it looks like we have a couple of viewers for sure. I think we have a good, maybe a hundred or so. Nice. Um, another part of this today, we are bringing back our trivia. I don't know if a lot of you were on our last episode, but uh, we had trivia issues, which we have ironed out. Um, during this trivia, you can go to, what is it, Mike? Play? Play.harprigging.com, and I just put it in the chat there for you all. All right, perfect. That way you guys can interact with us. We'll have some questions, see how much knowledge you guys know. Um, big thing about the trivia for you guys that are new, uh, trivia is time. So whether you know the right answer or not, the faster you answer, the more points. Um, we are going to give away, I do believe, a hat and a couple of harp shirts. So uh, for, let's say, the top three winners, we'll give away some stuff. So winner number one, we'll give you a hat. Yeah, and remember, guys, when you guys are playing the trivia, it's best to do it in a separate browser window or on a separate device. And if you are using a separate device, take it out of sleep mode. Otherwise, you may miss a question. Um, there is a little bit of uh, latency issues between our stream and the trivia. Our stream is about 20, 10 to 20 seconds behind or we're ahead of you guys. So definitely have your trivia ready. We might go to trivia faster than you think, faster than you see it on the stream. So we apologize for any latency. <clears throat> um, but uh, let's jump into this. Let's talk about how it's made. All right. So um, <clears throat> I think most people, uh, most of the viewers that are, are gonna be signed on right now, they're going to be accustomed to doing uh, like a layback uh, type of a, of a sleeve um, or an eye formation. And so, and that's um, very simply where you have like a Nyko or a Loose & Co type sleeve, um, the two kind of main US manufacturers out there of those products, uh, where you simply pass the, the cable through the sleeve, you, you turn it back, you uh, run it back through the sleeve, pull your uh, thimble tight in there. And then depending on the size, it's anywhere from uh, three to four crimps typically uh, on those with the with the appropriate tool. So that's, I think, what most people are, are common uh, are aware of. Um, we do that method as well uh, here in the in the shop. However, we also do a Flemished uh, style eye where we slide a, a sleeve over the uh, over the body of the wire rope, and then we actually unlay the wire rope, right? So we unbrand it. What's that? I'm going to interrupt you. I think we have a video of that, correct? Yeah, we do, right? All right. Uh, Ian, do you have that video, the Flemish video? So we'll kind of talk through that as we, as we go ahead and do that. All right, perfect. We're pulling that up as we speak. Also, everybody at home, we are just uh, going back and forth. We don't have a solid script. Um, we're relying on your questions to talk about this. Actually, here's a video. Yeah. All right. So now this is kind of where we're starting off. We've got the sleeve on the rope there. Um, this is a piece of 3A719. And kind of what I'm talking about here is 
depending on where we pick from on the right hand side from the top down or on the left hand side um, the right hand side top down we're going to have a shorter tail and that's important because we want that sleeve to pull up tight and encapsulate that thimble in the eye so we're going to Cole here is about to pick this, but uh, as he does, he's going to end up going uh, kind of the top, uh, top center right uh, when he picks these two strands. Now, as he picks those two strands, uh, we're going to lay it back uh, three returns. And, and it's where you see each one of those voids, those valleys there. Those are, that's the lay that from that very first one, full turn, full void to the third, not the very first one, because that very first one's going to be your tail length. So now he's going to, he's just going to simply bend it around, form the eye, pull it back into where your last lay and your first lay are kind of overlapping one another. And then uh, just dropping your tail into that void that you, uh, that you pulled it from earlier, running the tail underneath. <clears throat> Again, his tail is a little bit long right there, but he's about to just adjust it. And then at this point, he's going to pull this through. Now this thing's locked. Prior to him doing this, um, that uh, that tail could whip out and, and get him. So at this point, it's locked, and now he can manipulate it as he needs. He can now he just pulled it around and twisted it down, down and that shortened the tail. You see the the difference in the length there. So now he's going to finish off his tucks. His second, now his third. Okay and pull those last two strands up to meet uh, the other uh, five there. So at this point, um, we're almost there. Now I'm about to kind of hold up a, a sleeve there. So from the crotch there where the two pieces meet in the eye to the tail, um, that's our measurement from the end of the sleeve down to the taper of the sleeve. We want that distance, uh, that, that full body of the tail within that, uh, with within the barrel of the sleeve. So now as he pulls, pops in the thimble and pulls that down, that's pretty much it, right? So now you can kind of look down the barrel and you can see the strands inside of there. Um, those strands are right past the uh, beginning of the taper there. And so we know that we have enough contact area within the barrel uh, to where once we go through and we press this, that uh, we have the coefficient of friction that we need in order to uh, um, to sustain the load that we're going to be hanging on it, which in this case is is up to about 1.4 tons, and that's at a five to one design factor um, that we that we run these things at or we use these things at. All right, that's pretty much it. Yeah. Awesome. That that actually looks very simple, but uh, I've never done one. But yeah. I'm guessing that guy's done it for the last ten years. <laughs> yeah, and, and and then some. Um, so, uh, it, it is a, a rather simple technique, um, but even on a piece of three ace wire rope, you know, when we bring in, uh, new folks to, into the rigging shop, they, they say the exact same thing. They'll watch somebody do it once and they go, oh, okay, I, I got this. And then they <laughs> jump in there and then, uh, and they quickly and realize, <laughs> yeah, they quickly realize that that, that cable fights a lot, a lot more than it, it looks in there. But you know, there's techniques that you that you get in it, but uh, or kind of figure out and develop over time, and uh, and obviously you kind of get a mastery over it. Um, the reason, though, that we do this uh, style Flemish die over a, a layback uh, is mainly because we make these in production quantities, right? So um, it could be it could be ten, but it could be ten thousand too. Um, so if you're making two, five, 10,000 slings, and you as users out there, <clears throat> you obviously need those all relatively or almost exactly uh, the same length. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So as you're making your bridles, as, as you're uh, wrapping beams, whatever you're, however you're using these things, a five footer has to be a five footer and a 10 has to be a 10 footer. Otherwise your bridle lengths and everything else are off. So, so uh, doing a Flemished uh, style eye really ensures that we, we get them all uh, the same length each and every time. Um, Looks like you're busy there in the office this morning. Yeah, we're gonna. We'll say, yeah, it's yeah we'll like eight a.m. there, nine a.m. Yeah, we're yeah we're just starting to get busy. <laughs> Let's hope that's the last one. <laughs> um, but uh, 
but this does this method as long as all of our cut lengths are the are the same we pick from the same location every time um we keep our tail lengths the same then it doesn't matter if it's 10 slings or 10,000 slings we're going to make sure that they're all the same length now we do have a variance uh it's uh it's plus uh, or minus one diameter of the wire rope but uh we shoot for plus or minus half the diameter of the wire rope so it's always within you know one sling to the next uh one diameter of the rope so that's the reason that we go through and do it that way now uh that being said um you can only do a flemished eye from quarter inch up right and so depending on the industry that up could go up to three inch three inch wire rope um so uh anything below quarter inch three sixteenths eighth inch uh we do the exact same thing as everybody else uh here is used to doing and that's the layback style perfect I think we have some questions here. I'm we, do. Catch up. we do have a couple questions. Um, one of them is, do you ever see the tail popping out of the finished thimble? Or is it always inside of it? So that's, uh, I'm assuming that question is going to be referring to a layback style. Uh, yeah. like the, uh, And yes, <clears throat> so for a long time, uh, manufacturers of those sleeves required that there was one diameter of the wire rope sticking out of the uh, end of the uh, sleeve after the compression was done, right? And so that, uh, not a lot of people liked that, <laughs> um, obviously, uh, for reasons I'm sure that your, uh, that your viewer is writing that question because it does provide um, an opportunity to kind of cut your hand uh, on, the, on the wires that protrudes out. So, just this past year at LDI, we had a meeting with, uh, yeah, there you go. So now I'm going to have to go through and I'm going to have to qualify this, this uh, slide. Um, <clears throat> well, actually, no, we, we have changed it because we, we do have 0% on there now. Um, so just this past year, we had a meeting with Nicopress at LDI and we actually had a, uh, uh, a, a meeting there for the, for the public um where we brought uh, one of the one of the manufacturers of these sleeves in and uh and we talked about this now they do both manufacturers do allow uh for that tail to be flush with the end of the sleeve now right okay. um the reason for the requirement for the the tail to be uh extended out that one diameter prior to uh this really this past year was I mean when you think about it, it's it's density uh, across that compression there. So when I'm just going to illustrate like my hands here, this is my live end of my wire rope. This is my tail end of my ro wire rope inside of that sleeve. As they're stacked on top of each other, and my sleeve goes around that, and I compress down on that. You know, I have that full cross-sectional density uh, compression in there. But every compression that I move towards the end of the sleeve my tail end in there turns just a little bit, just minutely. And if, uh, if you all don't believe me, which I know a lot don't because I've had a lot question me on this, um, go through and, and make a sleeve, do your first compression. And then as you work your way down towards the end of the sleeve, moving away from the thimble towards the end of the sleeve, put your thumb on that tail as it's coming out. And as you make your compressions, just feel what happens on that tail. It starts to open up. And as it starts to open up, that full cross-sectional density that you started with on that first compression now gets a little bit less on the second, a little bit less on the third, a little bit less on the fourth. And so your efficiency is not, um, is not the same all the way through. Um, however, there has there we obviously know we work with design factors and they're far exceed what our, our working loads are and uh and manufacturers have done a lot of testing on this because this is an age-old complaint right the the tail sticking out so um they've gone through they've done a lot of testing and they are now allowing in writing that you do not have to have that tail extend past the sleeve all right good to know um another thing about this episode guys we are trying to 
do this in less than 45 minutes, trying to shorten these. Um, we went about two hours last time, so we're trying to make this one short and sweet, so we're not trying to get too deep. Yeah. Um, there's so much content, we could probably talk about this for several days. Yeah. But uh, we're going to jump into some trivia right away and uh, see how much knowledge our audience, do, uh, how much knowledge they do have. All right, as Ian gets trivia racked up, guys, remember you can go to play.harprigging.com on a separate device or on another browser window, and you can join the game. So, Ian, why don't you fire off that first question? And here it comes, guys. There you go. So, while this is running, um, da -da -da -da, thumber, load to do. So the question is, is when a single load is applied to the end of a single thimble eye sling, what does the load tend to do? Does it spin? Does it bounce up and down? Stretch the steel more than 1.15 times the normal length? Or does it cause the eye of the wire rope to change its actual shape? Now, this is just a straight well, hang. Yep, a straight hang off a piece of steel. Not much of a bridle, just a straight down hang. Yep, straight vertical drop on this, right? So as you said that, Jesse, about the 45 minutes thing, I realize I'm going to have to be a li little less long-winded in my explanations. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So it looks like we have 62% for A, and it's about 17% for C. Uh, Ian, what's the right answer there? And Andrew, do you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, that's it. Okay, so A is the right answer there. Um, and if you look at a piece of wire rope, yeah, I think it kind of comes uh, – It's it makes sense. Um Wire rope is a helical form, right? So as you apply a load to it, all those six outer uh, strands of wires around the core there start to try to pull themselves straight. So the uh, the only reason that they don't completely pull themselves straight to where you have a complete mass of, of wires coming from, from sleeve to sleeve is that... Uh, we have what we call the right regular lay. And a right regular lay means that those strands are going up and to the right, uh, but the wires within the strands are going to the left. So as the strands elongate and that helical form kind of gets pulled and twisted out, the wires in those strands are actually tightening up and to the point where it, it kind of reaches an equilibrium. And different constructions of wire rope, you're gonna get more or less rotation. Uh, there are a number of wire ropes that are built to control this exact thing. All right. Perfect. I would say that was definitely probably a trick question for a few people out there, but. Uh, yeah, the 1.15 was uh, <laughs> really <far night. laughs> Yeah, that was a tricky one for sure. Um, do you want to do one more back to back? Yeah, let's fire one more. One more and then we'll get some more content here. Cool guys, check your device. Um, so the next question is, what one of these markings are not required on a sling? A, the diameter mm -hmm. of size. B, rated loads for each type of hitch used. C, the name and trademark of the manufacturer. Or D, the color code of length. Oh, that's a tricky one. Definitely. Mm -hmm. We know those are all things that we're used to seeing. So while they're finishing up the question, Andrew, is there a standard color code for slings? Or does there are. everybody uh, kind of do their own thing? No, there's, there's standard color codes. So uh, especially in this industry. Um, so your fives are always red, your tens are always white, your twenties um, are always blue. Um, your thirties and fifties are actually where it deviates a little bit. Um, typically, uh, and, and we do them both. So if, if I'm off on this one, um, forgive me, but uh, the crowd will call you out for sure. So, yeah, right. <laughs> so usually it's uh, like the yellows are 30 and the greens are 50, but there are companies that kind of go back and forth on that. Yeah, um, we, are, we are yellow 30 here in yeah. the house, but yeah. Yeah. yeah so uh, those are the two that vary, but uh, for the most part, um, those first three are always a standard all the way across the board. All right. Let's see what uh, everybody thought. And it looks like a majority of people went with a D, 78% of them. All right. All right. Awesome. That, that is correct. We've got an informed crowd. Um, yeah, so those first three, uh, you know, they, those are, have to be on there uh, across any industry. Uh, traceability, uh, so you have to know the manufacturer that made those, um, the size of the, 
uh, diameter of the cable that you're working with and the capacity for all three hitches that are going to be used on those. So okay. those are requirements from uh, from the ANSI standard on that. All right. So actually talking about that, I got a couple samples here. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we'll use these two samples. I'm going to come out here in the middle of stage. So you can look. I think we have our robotic camera. Let's see. No, no, I'm not in position. I'm messing it all up. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a couple pieces of steel here. I have this one that actually has a tag, but it has a paper tag. Mm -hmm. um, does show five foot length, uh, vertical load, all that. So everything we need to know about it is 3 8 steel. Awesome. Um, has a fabrication code that I don't know what that means, but I guess it means something to somebody. Mm -hmm. But it does not have a manufacturer. Like, I have no way of tracking this back to anybody. Plus, okay. it's paper, and it looks like I could probably rip this off after the first yeah. gig. Yeah. So, <clears throat> there are a number of different uh, of tagging methods. Um, first off, in response to the, uh, to the uh, not having a manufacturer on there, again, it does have to have it on there. Uh, ANSI standard requires it just for exactly what I said. If, if there is an issue at all with it, it does need to be traceable back to the manufacturer so that uh, that issue can be addressed fully. Um, as far as the paper tags versus steel tags versus polymer tags, um, you got a good camera there. Um, there's a lot of companies that put it right where you're showing it there. Some companies, they will uh, they'll take a polymer tag and thinking back to when we just made that sling, they'll go through and they'll pick those two strands. They'll slide that tag all the way onto the body. They'll rewrap it, slide their, their sleeve on, and then make their eye. Um, my personal feeling on those is uh, typically, we see a lot of those that go missing um, because of the fact that, uh, again, as you put strain on that piece of wire rope, um, everything kind of next down, we get that uh, rotation that we talked about. Even on a typical load, it may not rotate 360 degrees, but everything does still pull tight under load. And when it does that, it kind of squeeze, per, puts a lot of uh, pinch point and friction where that, uh, that tag was put on there. So um, we see a lot of those missing. We don't end up doing that. The paper tags, as you said, they, they disappear quick. We choose to put a, uh, a steel ring tag um, on a piece of 1 16th wire rope. We tuck that down into the sleeve when we make it, and uh, and then yeah, yeah, ring tag here. Yeah, all right. That's, uh, we did a little. We had a little fun in the shop and cut this off so we could look at the insides. Yep, there you go. But, uh, we'll yeah, talk so, about that later. <laughs> yeah, so that's that's the way we we choose to do it. It keeps it out away from pinch points. Um, it's short enough to where it's not going to get caught by the shackle. It shouldn't get caught. At least it shouldn't in that case. Um, and so. Different methodology. Um, I personally prefer ours because that's the one we do. That's the one we chose to do. Uh, but, uh, but and those are the reasons why. All right, awesome. Um, I say I don't know if you want to jump into this. I had another one without a tag, which we definitely labeled for our shop demo stuff. So this one does not go on show site. But uh, this one actually doesn't have any thimbles. So yeah. I know this will uh, create a lot of commotion online, but. Uh, so a lot of our guys and guys we've seen in the industry, if it doesn't have a thimble, it doesn't go up. They don't use it, period. Throw it to the side. Um, what is your thoughts on that? So um, in a lot of different industries, uh, they never use thimbles, right? Um, so it's we've got thimble eyes, and then we have soft eyes. Um, what you're holding is an example of a soft eye. It's a thimble eye-sized soft eye, but, uh, but soft eye nonetheless. Um, so typically they're going to be more, uh, it's going to be a large eye if it's a soft eye, but, uh, but they're used all the time. So structurally, uh, as long as it passes all the other exceptions rejection criteria, that sling is fine. Uh, okay. But uh, we do put the thimbles in them because as that, as is evident on that sling there, um, <clears throat> it does elongate, it does neck down, could be, make itself a little bit more difficult to fit a shackle through, although it doesn't seem like that was the case right there. Yeah. Um, I was going to see if it was going to get stuck, but yeah. Uh, yeah, that's really yeah. not too bad. Um, but thing to keep in mind is a thimble is not a load bearing component. 
Uh, it is simply there to keep the form of the eye, right? So whether it has it or not, uh, as long as the strands or the wires aren't broken inside of that eye, uh, as long as the body itself is in good shape, then there's nothing wrong with using that sling. All right. I guess we're kind of going down the road of inspection a little bit right okay. now. So uh, actually, I got another piece of steel here. Um, actually, the fun part about this one, it's been a while, around for a little while, and we were sitting here right before we went live, and it's covered in red paint, of course, five-footer. And we scraped it off, and it's actually one of your pieces of steel. It's Wait. probably been around for quite a few years. It's been beat up a little bit. But, uh, yeah, we. I mean, of course, everybody has a lot of everybody's steel, but it happened to be one of yours. Um, this one has some good kinks in it. I mean, they're not horrible, but uh, just wondering what your thought is. Like, is this still usable? Like, are we right there at that borderline? Should we have it inspected? Yeah. So from what I'm seeing from here, um, that – piece of wire rope. Obviously, I'm not doing a finite inspection on it, but uh, yeah, even better. But uh, that piece of wire rope, uh, I would have no issue using it uh, as long okay. as there's no broken wires in it. Um, now, we could get into an argument here and uh, uh, or some, some might try that, but uh, because the standard does call out that any permanent deformation of the rope structure uh, is going to render it uh, rejected. Okay. Well, I could push some of these out a little bit, but they seem like they're, they kind of want to stay that way. It's probably yeah. been up and down a hundred times. Yeah, exactly. So that's the thing. I mean, as soon as you put that uh, in place, the very first time you wrap a beam with a, with a choker, it is going to take the form of that beam. You, you, you as you wrap it and hang a motor off it um, or bridle it, whatever you're going to do, um, it's going to take the form. So by the letter of the law, the very first time you use that thing, um, quite often, it's going to take the form of what it went around. And so you could argue that it is, it needs to be discarded after one use. Nobody's, nobody's uh, doing that. <laughs> it's going to run a uh, successful production <laughs> company is going to do that. So it does kind of come into play where, Yes, you have uh, some bends in there. I would call those bends, not kinks. Um, to where uh, it, it, it's fine to be continue to use. Um, it does bring up the uh, conversation of protecting those edges. So going through, wrapping those beams with burlap, doing everything we can in order to kind of soften those, those corners so that we're not creating hard kinks in there. We're going to get some bends. It's going to happen. <clears throat> um, but, uh, but as long as we don't have a hard kink to where we're causing a, uh, a concerned stress riser down to the core of that thing, then we're going to continue to use them. All right. So you're pretty we're much leaving up, to do the, you're leaving up to the head rigger to decide how bad the kink is. And, For sure. And then that's what I said. If, if it's getting down <clears throat> to where we're concerned that it's causing a stress riser in the, uh, at the core level, right to the center of the thing, then, you know, that's, that's a conversation we need to have. Um, but just flat out by going off the ANSI standard on it. And I'm not advocating. We just throw away the ANSI standards. That's not a point of this, but uh, just, to go through uh, and discard every piece of steel that has a form like that, that you can't get out afterwards. It is a permanent deformation. It is. And yeah, we never make any money. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's not bad enough to where you need to discard that sling. I could go through, I could put that sling into one of our test beds and break it. And it's going to break uh, far above the 12,100 pounds that it needs to. Actually, speaking of that, um, let's look at one of your test beds. Or 14,000. Yeah. Actually, before we do that, we have uh, several questions in the chat. <laughs> I'm sure it's busy. <laughs> um, you talk about the ANSI standards. I know I might be putting you on the spot here, but do you know what standard that is? For? So um, it's the ANSI B3010 is the uh, the wire rope one. Um, Actually, B do we have that in the slides here? We I don't think we do. Right. Yeah, we had a couple uh, slides to refer to, but uh, we just got a lot of extra stuff that we probably yeah. not and nobody likes slides and right. slides all day. Um, so I'm pretty sure that one, and, and I'm sorry, I'm 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 uh, kind of going <laughs> off memory here. B thirty ten, B thirty nine 
is is hooked. B3010, I believe his slings. B3016 is when it gets into the to hoists, but I'm fairly certain it was the B3010. All right. Um, some other questions. Is there a diameter ratio you need to adhere to when you're not using a thimble? Diameter ratio when you're making the eye? Yeah. Um, so I guess that question is how small can you make the eye? That's what uh, I think you're looking for. Yeah. So when we're going through and we're using running ropes, um, this is going to be, this is going to give you some guidance. This is not going to be an exact carryover to what your question is, but, uh, the smallest that we end up using is about a 15 to one, uh, D to D ratio. So it's the diameter of, of the bend versus the diameter of the cable that we're going through. Um, so that'll give you an, an idea of it, um, in, in, uh, entertainment industries for running ropes. We're typically talking about 32 to one, but the smallest in other industries about a 15 to one. Um, if you keep your eye, uh, and this is, I'm going to say it, it actually is going to be probably about a 20 to one as I'm just kind of thinking the math through in my head, but that, that dimension, keep in mind, go from the end of the sleeve, uh, on the thimble side or the the eye side, not the body side of the of this uh, eye, but the end of the sleeve on the eye side to the bearing point. If you go about twenty to one in there, um, that'll give you a ratio that'll that will keep it about the size of the thimble, um, and will, and would be a good number to work off of. I hope that answers the question. There's nothing published that says it, but um, but you could create. A stress riser if you go too small and then you throw that over um you know a shackle or something if you run a piece of three ace or uh, even quarter inch and you run a quarter inch shackle in there you're gonna basically have a a knife edge bend in there so that yeah. would reduce the capacity awesome Perfect. awesome actually uh, we're running down on time here i think we got maybe another 20 minutes so let's jump into a few uh trivia Perfect, Ian. Uh, if you want to get the next question ready, uh, guys, remember you can go to play.harpregging.com to join the trivia. We are giving away uh, a hat and a couple shirts today. Um, and so let's fire that next question. I say maybe we'll give away some uh, broken steel here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. If you are in the field and you have a wire rope without a tag, what do you do with it? Uh, inspect it before use if it looks like the same batch as the rest. B, remove from service for shop inspection and retagging. C, use only if the color codes on the ends of the steel are correct. Or D, use on points that are less than 1,000 pounds only. And then uh, while they're wrapping that up, I do have another question from the audience for you, Andrew. Uh -huh. What's the, the life of a steel rope? As long as it passes the acceptance rejection criteria. Um, that could be <laughs> That could be its first... Uh, time out, or that could be 25 years. Um, I would say if Mike's rigging, it's probably his first time out. He, <laughs> he likes all heavy stuff, so no. <laughs> it's, uh, we all have those walls of shame. <laughs> Perfect. So it looks like uh, we have 92%, 56 answers, I think that says, for B. Yep. All right. So we got some smart perfect. people out there. Definitely. We, yep. we tried to pick you up with that 1,000 pound. I didn't know if it was your slide, but. Uh... <laughs> Perfect. Uh, Ian, let's fire one more. All right, guys, if the thimble of the eye of the wire rope is missing, what do you do? Do you throw the wire rope away, never to be used again? Uh, install a new thimble if it is the original thimble and put it back into use. Must be a new thimble and inspect it before use or use without the thimble. Thimble is just there for extra protection. All right. Yeah, this was this one's gonna be hard because a lot of people practice different ways. Yeah, and uh, and there's thoughts, thought processes that will carry over from shackles and everything else on this. Yeah, absolutely. Now this is all for fun, so nobody uh, come and hurt us afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. We didn't say where I was right. What's that? So we didn't say where I was right. <laughs> <laughs> I would say Nevada somewhere. <laughs> yeah. There you go. Cool. Yeah. Um, 66% that say D. Andrew, what's the correct answer there? Yeah, D, D it is. Um, 
So you can go ahead and use it uh, without the thimble. As we just talked about, a thimble is not a load bearing component, right? So it is there to help that eye keep its form for a, uh, a longer period of time, but it is not a load bearing component. All right. Now, every, every rigging shop does have its different practices. So it might be part of their practice to, if a thimble is missing, put it aside, never use. So we totally understand that. But it, like Andrew is saying, is not necessary, but follow what your leadership is telling you for sure. Yeah, and, and honestly, okay, so that's kind of a, a short answer, and I guess this is why I get long-winded all the time. But uh, if a thimble is, um, you know, is damaged, you know, if it's so, a lot of times you put a load on it, and a thimble uh, up at the apex, up at the crown, it'll kind of spread out a little bit right there. It'll flare out. And then the legs itself will kind of pull in and compress uh, quite a bit. So it's not its original form. Um, we get a, we see them all the time. I don't, I don't fail that. Uh, again, it's not structural to the sling. However, we'll also see them where that thimble is damaged. And maybe it's, it was overloaded to the point where that crown is now spread out so much that on either side of that crown where the radius turns uh vertical or, or linear, it's now pinching in to the wire rope. Well, that's a different story, right? So now I'm creating a stress riser, a pinch point on the, on the structural item. I got to take that out of service at that point. So it's, um, there is more that needs to, to be looked at when it comes to damage on wire rope slings. But the, the uh, thought to keep in mind is, is it impacting the structural element of the wire rope? Right. Perfect. Um, and it looks like we have a pretty close race here. Ian, can you throw the leaderboard up for everyone? Right now, we have Kevin out in first with 342 points, with Andy right behind him at 329, and Nick uh, with 319. So it's a really close race there. And I'm her uh, preference. Uh, Mike is not good at reading last names. He messes them up every That's time. Why so I don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I, apo I apologize, but uh, we don't want to slaughter your last name. <laughs> it's it's fun to see that I recognize some of those names on there. Perfect. Awesome, awesome. All right. All right. So let's keep moving forward. All right. Um, so a lot of people were asking about. Um, what you guys use to crimp the sleeves and um, somebody asked if uh if using a manual method versus a machine method and how that differs i know you guys have multiple machines in your warehouse that you guys use for different purposes why don't you yeah. know that yeah okay um so um there's an efficiency rating uh either either way so a uh the nyco or loose tool and i'll have to throw their names out there just for you know visual reference there for, for folks but uh, that's about a 90 to 94 percent efficient uh compression uh when you do it and again it kind of it, it factors in off of the diameter of the wire rope uh that's right. i'm gonna stop you real quick we do have videos if you want to play the video and describe some of this at the same time yeah so let's see this, what we're is, this is of our presses um here is that the video yeah, right? the compression okay. video yeah. yep all right so we do have a, a couple different presses and I'll kind of start in with this. Okay. So, um, that back there in the corner, uh, and I'm sorry for my video quality. This is iPhone and I'm not Navy guy. Say, we kind of forced you to take these. We're like, Hey, we need some uh, footage of the shop. You're like, okay. <laughs> so that little green one I'm showing, um, that's a little 220 ton, uh, C frame press. We take that out into the field quite a bit. Um, that wire up, that's a 1500 ton press. That'll go up to a uh, three inch wire rope there. That is a national thousand ton press. That'll do two inch uh, wire rope, um, kind of all day long, but our bread and butter, our most popular press is this 500 ton, uh, C frame ESCO press. So this thing we use all day long. So now what I'm kind of showing here is two different dies. So we have a standard half inch die that I just put my hand on that one in the back is a quick pass die. Um, so the standard die, it's a cylindrical form uh, formed die, uh, the pocket on it. Now this one here, you can kind of see where it's uh, octagonal, right? So the whole, the reason is a standard die, I have to bring this thing down about halfway or my compression halfway, 
then turn it 90 degrees three quarters of the way, then turn it 90 degrees all the way down. <clears throat> and it's just time, right? Whereas my octagonal quick pass die, um, I can close it first time down, open it up, turn it um, like 60 degrees, close it again, and I'm done. So two compressions for the quick pass, whereas I usually wind up five to six compressions on the, um, on the standard die. And when you're doing that, uh, it's time, right? So if I'm doing 10,000 slings, um, it's, uh, it's a lot of time in there. So it's got its mate already installed. So I'm going to move that out of the way there. Now, uh, one of our riggers, Carlos here, he is going to, uh, he's, he's going to demonstrate the quick pass. Now he's already installed the, the, uh, tag. We've got a little bit long of a tail on that, uh, on that tag tether, but, uh, for this demonstration, it'll work. I was trying to show that the, uh, wires in there where it should be, but it's kind of hard to show. <clears throat> um, I just demonstrated it though. Uh, so now he's going to go through and he's going to put it in, lines it up into the pocket. It's got, uh, it's got a collar on the far side that uh, stops it. And as he brings it all the way in, all the way down right there, there's a cutoff. There's an overload uh, switch that's, that activates. So it stops pressure when it's all the way down. Second compression. And he's going to pull it out and that thing is done. So it's easy to see the difference between a quick pass die because it's going to take the form of whatever it is. Um, it's going to either be a fully cylindrical round sleeve or it's going to have that octagonal shape to it. And, uh, and, and so it's very visible. You can, you can see the difference on how it was pressed and what was pressed in. Very cool. Very cool. Um, speaking of videos, my, my favorite video that uh, you sent to us a few days ago when we mm -hmm. started talking about this was your pull test. Yeah. Um, actually seeing how much it takes to break one of these. All right. So uh, if we could put that in the queue. Okay. No, so ready. this one, this, this again, this we did, obviously three ace is a very common size. So I did all these out of three ace. Um, so as we're, uh, as we're bringing this up now, I had said earlier, uh, 12,100, I was a little, I was off on that. Um, it's 14,400 is what these things should break on. So, and they should always break at a specific location, right? So I've got this uh, teed up right at the, yeah, right at the upper sleeve. And as we see, that's exactly where it broke. So pan down here, our jacket kind of pushed down, but, uh, but because of the pinch point that we create in that press, as we go through and we compress that down, we could create um, a stress riser right where that sleeve meets the body of the sling. And when we do that, um, we create a, uh, a stress riser in there that is going to cause a weak point. So when we, uh, when we brake test it, they should always, every time, break at one sleeve or the other right where it meets the body. If it ever pulls out or if, uh, if it ever breaks somewhere else uh, in, the, in the sling, then we had a reason. If it breaks in the body, we had a weak point in that body. We had uh, a reason. We had a, a you know broken strands or broken wires, a kink, something else that would have caused that. Um, if it's in good condition, it should always break at that sleeve. All right. Have you seen a lot of breaks? Just testing, maybe even other people's steel coming in or anything like that, or uh, well, like a bad batch or something. You guys got in and tested it. Um. So we go through and. Uh, and we do kind of the um, um, ASME tests on it. So out of every hundred uh, slings that we make, we'll break three. Okay. Um, now structurally, we really don't find many that you know are in good condition that have no reason to break low or break otherwise. Um, they they typically always break it asleep. Now. Okay this can kind of lead into a conversation as far as um, import versus domestic, I guess. Absolutely. That's a huge conversation. Okay. Uh, All right. So if we got a minute to get into that. Yeah, let's jump into that. Okay. So we, um, we've had folks in the past, like, again, I've been doing this a long time. We've made a lot of contacts and some of those, those contacts, they've worked for companies where it's domestic, domestic, domestic. Um, and that's just, 
That's that's their internal house rules. Um, domestic's a lot more expensive, right? If you're going full domestic product all the way through, it is it's very expensive. Um, typically three to four times the cost of uh, an import wire rope. Okay, so we'll get requests and specs in for um, I need so many threes or, or fives, tens, twenties, whatever, and uh, you know all domestic. And we'll typically call. Go. Are you sure you want domestic? Because there's only two manufacturers, um, three, but in what in these constructions and uh, for general purpose, it really comes down to two manufacturers that, that supply it, and it's expensive. And for something that you're going to use, I don't know, for a couple of years and throw away, the 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 value is just not going to be realized. So that's not to say that we just cheapen it up and we throw whatever piece of crap in there. Um, we do select uh, imports from mills that uh, um, that we've already qualified. Um, we choose not to use mills from certain countries because the structural integrity it isn't is never an issue. Is never a question. But uh, we we showed earlier a lay length, right? When we were laying that that thimble, and that's that distance from one void to the next. Okay, so if we go through and and that lay length varies quite a bit, then it makes it a pain pain for us to go through and make that eye. It could be where we have to do a long tail uh, three turn on one spool and a short tail four turn on the next because the lay lengths differ. And from a fabrication manufacturing standpoint, you just can't deal with that, All right? So um, structurally, uh, that there isn't an issue. When I talk about that 14,400 pounds, uh, my domestic's going to meet that, my import's going to meet that. And as we showed there, I think we were, uh, uh, we were like 14, 15,000 pounds plus uh, on that break there. They are all going to exceed the nominal. Um, so what it really kind of comes down to is, is problems in the manufacturing. And because of that, we've selected only a certain amount of mills that we do. So that, you know, I, I hope that kind of gives some, some insight on domestic versus import. D they're all made domestically. The quality of the fabrication is adhered to. Um, the quality of the components is also, uh, something that we, that we should stay on top of, uh, vigorously. And, uh, and like I said, um, those are batch tested and, and we have those records so that we can validate and verify where those, where each one of those are going to break at. Um, but you know, there are certain ones that we don't use just be because of the, uh, the composite construction of the component itself of the wire rope. All right. So I guess the biggest thing is really you guys put your name on it at the end of the line anyway. Mm -hmm. So if anything happens, it comes back to your name, no matter exactly. where you guys sourced it from. Uh, we had this conversation in our last episode about shackles. Uh -huh. That's a whole big deal. Uh, well, domestic, domestic, absolutely yep. all of that. But yep. yeah, yeah, you can't go to the king of China to you know, say my shackles bad because I right. only said China. <laughs> and yeah. you have the stamp name of where it was manufactured, the trademark yep. name. Exactly. Yeah. So and, so, and to your point, right? You know, we are putting our tag on there, so it does have that trademark name on there. Um, that's why the the standard requires it. Um, now when we get into shackles, that's a whole different story, right? Cause Absolutely. So we don't want to open that ball. Exactly. We're not, I'm not, you know, we're, we're a domestic, uh, shackle, uh, supplier. Um, and that's for a reason, right? So we've gone through, we've done break tests on shackles and where that, sh that pin actually bends and shears the ears on that shackle, uh, flare out the whole bow of the shackle sucks down. It's mangled. It's a mess. <laughs> but where that thing shears, I can still, I've had it to where I can still unthread that little nub of thread that's still in the threaded side of the ear, right? Wow. So that's quality. Um, and they always fail in a similar method. Whereas imports, they shatter in a lot of different methods. So um, I don't carry over my philosophy on wire rope components into shackles. <laughs> totally understandable and i'm sure we could have a uh, 10 more episodes just about shackles no, no, no. and the, everything more about wire rope because we barely scratched the surface today um speaking of that i think we gotta wrap up here shortly let's get into our final two questions and trivia all right 
and then we'll kind of wrap up a little. Perfect. perfect. And if you want to rack the last uh, two questions, remember, guys, you can go to play.harpringing.com to join in the trivia. And we are giving away a hat and a couple shirts today to the first, uh, the top three. Uh, Ian, go ahead, fire in when you're ready. Cool. Uh, this question is during the inspection process to test breaking point, where should a sling typically break? At on the end of the eye, uh, the top of the radius of the eye, or at the end of the thimble side of the sleeve, in the exact center of the length of the wire rope, or all at the eye on the body side of the sling? Which uh, we went over this. Uh, yeah, we just talked about it. So you, you guys should. 100%, folks. Uh, it needs to be 100%. See who was paying attention. <laughs> see how good of a teacher you are there, Andrew. <laughs> oh, no, let's not make that reflect on me. <laughs> <laughs> There's no expectation at that point. I would say maybe fourth prize. Uh, we'll uh, have Andrew buy somebody lunch. No. <laughs> 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 so we got you a go little bit of a them. split here, a 55 55 <laughs> split. Okay. So, oh, and, interesting. Uh, interesting. The correct answer is, is B. B right? So I think, let's see, I'm looking at what B is there at the, at the eye on the thimble side of the sleeve. So maybe, um, be confusing so, there. yeah, maybe some people didn't exactly understand what that is. But just to that point, like we said, when we press that sleeve, we cause a stress rise or we pinch into the body of it. And so we do pinch into both sides of the wire um, on both sides of the sleeve. However, on the top side at the thimble, which is where B is talking about, we have two legs of wire rope coming out of that side. So because of that, uh, we have double the strength. Um, and that's why uh, we are always going to break on the bottom side of the, of the sleeve or uh, to be more particular on the body side of the sleeve. All right, so yeah, this one might've been a little confusing. We apologize. We have, uh, we have a couple of interns in the back. I think they're turning six here soon. So uh, <laughs> they type up all our questions for us. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's all we can afford right now. We're on budgets around here, but uh, <laughs> um, let's uh, give them one more. Yeah, see who we have for a winner. I'm glad to see everybody gives each other a hard time, and no matter what company it is. Oh yeah. <laughs> cool. Let's do uh, the next question. What does the term IWRC stand for? Right. A independent wire rope core inverted wire rope center, independent wire rope connection, or internal wire rope car? Now, we didn't get to cover this, but we're just testing knowledge. Yeah, exactly. So we'll, uh, we'll see what we come up with because there's there's obviously one answer, but there's some creative ones. There. A few of those are, could be intuitive. Yeah, and maybe uh, once since this question is pretty well, yeah. we will untangle this strand that we have next to us after this, and then kind of wrap sure. up. Okay. Perfect. Awesome. And looks like a little bit of a split. Uh, Fifty-seven yeah. thirty-two. Okay. And the answer is A. Independent yeah, yeah, yeah. rope core. Okay, so an IWRC um, does stand for independent wire rope core, um, and some people refer to it as independent wire rope center. So both of those are absolutely fine. If any of you know it as, as center, uh, you're not wrong. Um, but uh, a 719 uh, cable, um, we have, a, we have a, a couple slides here. If we want to just hit those real quick. I know we don't have much time. Yeah, real quick, before you, while well, Jesse's looking for the slide, uh, can you put up the leaderboard again? Perfect. And there's our winner, Dave, uh, in first, Evan in second, and Zachary in third. Guys, we'll send out a couple of shirts and a hat to you guys. Uh, either send me a, a, a private message in Facebook, or you can uh, send an email to me at mike dot or mike at heartbreaking dot com. Um, and we'll collect, get your information and we'll get those out to you. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank Good you, job. everybody, for playing. I uh, hope you guys had fun there. Uh, uh, luckily, we got to use it this time and uh, with a little bit of trouble we had last time. So. All right. I just jumped into the slides here. I'm probably on the wrong slide, so I apologize, everybody. Um, no, you're good right there. Uh, yeah, okay. Well, yeah, either either one of those. So um, really, it's it's, you know, this is our rendering of it, so it's not. <laughs> it's not the best uh, to be yeah, easier. Side back and forth with you two there. 
Okay. Um, all right. Well, I'm going to start here while I try to figure out how to do that. Oh, I got it at the bottom. <laughs> um, okay. So what we have here, if you look at the cross section of the wire rope um, here on the left, all six of those strands, uh, I'm sorry, seven of those strands look identical, right? Including the core. Um, now, if I jump over, uh, let's see, to this one. Um, this is my 625 or 619. Now, you'll see there that we have a 625 IWRC RRL XIPS. Um, so that IWRC is, uh, if, if you look at the linear um, cutaway of it from the side of the, of the piece of wire rope, um, you'll see where we've removed those two, three strands there, that those interior strands, um, it's not one continuous piece of wire rope like the 719 is. Do you see the difference on the core between that one there and that one there? Absolutely. Okay, so uh, IWRC means independent wire rope core or center um, because it is an independent design from the outer strands. In essence, that, that core is a smaller diameter piece of wire rope unto itself. So it has a core and it has six outer strands itself. The difference is this uh, RRL uh, aspect of the call out. Right regular lay, I touched on that earlier. Um, cable's gonna go up to the right, although this doesn't look like it does. This looks like it goes up to the left. So it's, it's incorrect, but uh, the, strand, the uh, individual wires within it um, run the opposite direction. So it goes up to the right, but the strands go up to the left. Um, whereas on the core, it's up to the right and the strands uh, or the wires within it go the same direction. And that's a uh, reason because it's general industry uh, it's used in general industry quite a bit, and they use it for a lot of different things. And sometimes you end up using these for running lines. And that design helps the wires to... Um, it looks like you're busy there. <laughs> Getting yeah. busy. Hey, Pete. <laughs> Pete. No. Um, so the, uh, the wires run the same way as the strands, and because of that, it kind of creates softer... Um, uh, softer crowns and cuts down or reduces um, internal abrasion uh, from that construction of the rope. So those are the differences uh, on it, and that, but that is what IWRC means. It uh, the it's the core difference between the two. Gotcha. Unfortunately, we need to wrap up here shortly. Um, we might have to talk about a part two of this because there's a there's a yeah. lot of questions. There's a lot more to cover. So maybe we'll uh, see if we can do a part two one of these days, see what your schedule's like, and see if uh, you guys would like to tune back in. Um, well, we kind of barely scratched the surface on a lot of this. Yeah, definitely, definitely. There's actually a lot more I wanted to try to cover with these guys. But uh, thank you guys so much for attending another episode. Um, our goal is to be doing one episode a week, ideally, trying to get information out to you guys, bringing in the gurus of the industry on different topics. Maybe we'll talk about trust next, maybe back to wire rope, who knows? I'm um, just trying to bring everybody in and uh, get you guys the most amount of knowledge that you can. Yeah, looking in the chat, everybody wants a part two, which is great. Um, and guys, you know, uh, as we continue to do these, uh, if there's anything that you guys want to uh, see, you know, any topic that you guys think that would be beneficial for everybody, uh, send us some messages and uh, we'll see what we can do. Yeah, hit us up on Facebook, however, email, any form. We're here at many different ways. Um, I don't know if you want to wrap us up a little bit there, Andrew. Talk about yourself. Come visit you or anything like that. I don't know if everybody knows about uh, so yeah. so much. Yeah, well, um, so if you're ever out on the West Coast here, um, you know, it, we are a full-scale, full-service uh, ring shop. I kind of touched on a little bit in the beginning when we were talking about it. So um, whether it's uh, – Wire rope, um, hardware, soft goods, sling, um, you know, polyester slings, round slings, steel spans, uh, or hoist. You know, we're we're a provider service center here on, here out in Las Vegas. Um, you know, please come look us up. We'd be happy to give you more of a tour as far as what we do and um, and how we do it. And 
happy to work with uh, with you guys as well as Harp. Uh, really appreciate this opportunity, guys, and uh, this Absolutely. has been a lot of fun. So look forward to more more of these. All right. Well, thank you, Andrew, and uh, everybody at home. We'll be in touch. We'll let you know if we could uh, make a part two happen. So uh, we'll talk to you soon. Cool. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.